There are different challenges with many similarities in different parts of South Africa. On the one hand, we've got Nelson Mandela Bay, and we've, we've spent quite a lot of time talking about the Nelson Mandela Bay challenge, where they approached uh, the so-called day zero because the dams went down in the level and quantity of water there. On the other hand, you have the KwaZulu Natal problem, which was uh, sadly experienced the flood, etc. But the infrastructure challenges, uh, you know, when you examine what is actually happening there is the infrastructure was not in good shape prior to the flood. So the flood exacerbated the situation, sure enough, but at the same time, the notion of dams in KwaZulu Natal, as you know, that's on the coast, so you have plenty of water in the sea, so to say, there. Similarly, in the Nelson Mandela Bay area, despite the fact that there are not water in the dams that they were using. Now let's come closer home, which is uh, for some of us, which is Gauteng, right? The situation in Gauteng, the Deval Dam level is in the region of 94%. So it's well known receives its water from ultimately from the Sutu Highlands via a number of channels and through other dams like the Stadfontein Dam, which is a much deeper dam, so it can store more water than the Val Dam, although the surface area of the Val Dam is much larger. So the rate of transpiration and water loss in the Val Dam is higher, so strategically South Africa has always kept its water in the Stadfontein Dam. So the bottom line here is we have water in the Val Dam, right? So building another dam, is it going to solve the problem in the Gauteng area? I'm not so sure. Because if the Val Dam is 94% full, on the one hand, it shows we have sufficient resource. On the other hand, we import the water from the Lesotho Highlands. And I think we've also discussed in the past that the Lesotho Highlands Phase 2 project has been delayed by several years for many reasons we've talked about in the past. That delay will impact the level of water coming into the Val Dam into the future. However, it's not a current problem. And generally, this time of the year, we do, we're not normally blessed with having around 94% of water in the Val Dam. It's normally much lower if you look at the history. So I think the Val Dam, by all accounts, is in good shape for now in terms of a resource for Gauteng. So I'm not so sure that us building more dams here will solve the problem. Perhaps it could be one eater. Although one would want to look at desalination in terms of using seawater there, where possible, because that's a technology that is maturing. In KZN, there are different problems, both on the water and the wastewater side. The wastewater situation is really bad because of all these pump stations that have been damaged, not been maintained for many years, and hence you're getting a pollution problem into the Amgeni River and into the beaches, you know, beautiful beaches that we like to go and swim in. Now, that doesn't mean that our other resources are not being polluted, like the Val Dam and the Stadfontein Dam and all of the other water resources. So pollution is an issue and we need to stop that instantly. Now, in terms of the key challenge in Hong why are we not getting water through the tap? I think this is perhaps the issue that consumers and users want to know most about. So in my analysis, the situation, Benoit can, can comment, sure, at a point in time in, in Gauteng, where the big problem is right now, we've been experiencing this for the past couple of weeks, is that the major utility, which is land water, a large utility which supplies water as a wholesaler to the retail sector, which is the municipalities, of which there is about 17 of them that are supplied by ran water, the biggest being Johannesburg, right? So ran water abstracts the water from the Val Dam, it purifies it through two treatment plants, one in Farinachang and the other one called Sekerbosch, both in the south of Johannesburg. Between these two, they produce in the region at maximum, you know, 4,800 million liters per day. Now that is assuming that both those plants are running at 100% capacity and that there's nothing wrong with the infrastructure in those plants and there's no maintenance that is occurring and everything is firing like a well-oiled machine. You would probably get around in the region of 4,800, perhaps if you push it 4,900. 900, uh, which is not the best thing to do because you need to be maintaining infrastructure as well. Given that they may well be operating at that level, why are we still running out of water in the tap? Well, a number of factors came into play here. I think that there was some degree of exacerbation of the problem through the load shedding issues, which does impact on pumping. 
because we need power to pump water, okay? But that's an intermittent problem that occurs because rainwater is the last resort in terms of load shedding. Wherever they are being supplied directly from ESCOM, they should not be experiencing load shedding per se, but they could be impacted through municipalities that may be supplying some of the pumps or some of their stations along the route. So that's one issue. The primary issue, in my view, is the notion that rainwater has indicated that the permit, the abstraction permit, they were exceeding their license, so to say, in terms of abstraction. That was quickly changed, as I read in the media, by the minister saying, fine, for the next nine months, you can abstract the water that you think you, you, you require in order to purify and provide water with an unseen amount of supply. Hypothetically, the challenge, I believe, is that I don't believe, and I'm not aware that rainwater is capable of supplying more than that maximum quantity that I mentioned, because the additional augmentation of plan, in other words, the additional capacity to treat water, which requires expensive infrastructure, those projects are not live right now, meaning that we do not have capacity to supply more than 4,800, 4,900, despite what you do to the water permit. Of course, many people are concerned that by increasing the water permit, you're actually postponing the inevitable because that water permit uh, abstraction license was put in at a certain quantity in order to preserve the environment and the ecosystem and, and, and you know, to take care of other users downstream. But understanding that we have a challenge, that permit license may have been extended now increased but you have to be able to purify the water in order to increase the total quantity of water so that total quantity of water one is not sure that we will be able to increase that first secondly i think it's a well-known fact that and this is a common problem now to Houteng, kzn and to the uh, nelson uh, nelson mandela bay area and to the entire south african region that in the municipal system in your distribution network right the reticulation network of the municipalities we're losing in the region on average 40 percent of water this means that basically in layman's terms what happens is rainwater purifies the water it supplies it to the municipalities here at Gauteng. before the municipality supplies it to our homes we lose 40 percent of expensive purified scarce resource water into the ground now herein lies a huge challenge that's 40 percent being lost so in the event of rainwater supplying some uh, 4800 for example if we take 40 percent then that's at least like 2,000 million liters a day that's going down the drain that nobody can use. Now, can we arrest this situation quickly? Therein lies the huge challenge for South Africa. The global experience demonstrates that, yes, you can arrest this challenge, but you cannot do it overnight. It's going to take you many years to do this. And of course, there are strategies that uh, you can use, there are tools you can use to measure what's occurring. Uh, you need to fix the pipelines, the infrastructure. So to make a long story short, I can't see and one would like to believe but when one is hesitant to believe that this problem is about to go away tomorrow morning or next week or next month we are now in a situation <laughs> where it requires major stakeholders to work together to put our differences aside to tackle the problem in a very strategic fashion to you know to celebrate the gains that we will make to look at case studies of how we can replicate elsewhere in this country and we will be hopefully if we get all that right it will take us some years for us to get our head above water literally so to say colloquially so that that's my analysis at this point of the situation uh, i'm not intending to paint a bleak picture but you know being a scientist and an engineer and a water expert it's my responsibility to analyze the situation for what it is and put it out there to our viewers, our listeners and the public so that we begin to understand that this, this problem was not created last week, nor last month, nor last year. It takes many years to create a problem of this nature because your infrastructure was not maintained, your planning perhaps was good, but your execution was not good in terms of your long-term sustainability of water supply and water. So a number of things are not in place which leads to a current pro a problem and as some have have defined it's like a cocktail of issues that are currently happening simultaneously and hence we are where we really don't want to be today with a, a problem of this nature in, in a nutshell that's what i think the story is so on, on the day
dams, the biggest consumer of water, 50 to 80 percent, is actually evaporation, and that's increasing. So there is, and firstly, uh, rainfall patterns have changed due to climate change. We don't believe in climate change due to whatever, but it's happening. Um, the measurements are there. So storing water in dams, in actual fact, is not a very bright thing to do. We don't have the water to fill them up anyway. So we, we can park that one. I think that discussion is closed already <clears throat> from a scientific or engineering perspective. The issue of, um, you know, I see a lot of people saying we've sabotaged Eskom, we've sabotaged the water and all this. No, no, we haven't. There's a common thread and it's called governance. And governance at an economic level has lapsed. The economy has tanked. And what happens is through pure ineptitude downstream with network industries like logistics. Um, so let's talk about PRASA and non-existent railway lines, energy and water and wastewater. What happens is though there's not enough um, skills or money in the system to lubricate the asset management. So what's common to all of our cities and the small the small towns are far worse than this. There, there, there's 100, 150 who do not have water seven days a week. Okay, it doesn't make the news anymore. People are in South African terms hurtful. You know, they just it doesn't sell anymore because it, you know it's a norm. And this has been carrying on for 20 years already. So it's a slow onset disaster. So what's common is that the retail network, so the water conveyance system and the sanitation, because 70 percent what comes in in water goes out of sewage is in actual fact past its sell by date okay by 20 to 30 years and in Joburg even more a lot of the the the, the infrastructure is in actual fact 50 to 100 years old if you maintain it properly you can keep it going 40 50 before you go to replace it we have not done that okay so now you have any excuses that's where we actually sit so there's a common thread the reality it's going to take 10 to 20 years to fix up if we can say in Johannesburg for example where there is is 23 billion and they said we're going to try and fix it in 10 years we're going to spend 2.3 billion a year that means we must double the price of water straight away um, because they're spending just under a billion a year uh, or around about a billion because their multi-year budget so it's over three year cycle is three three billion three point three billion that's so a billion a year we're going to spend two to two and a half times that so that money doesn't come government doesn't have money it's our money okay so it comes from there. now then we'll say well why has Cape Town not got the same issue well because the money goes to the right places that's the first thing and secondly because more people pay so on average in South Africa 59% of households don't pay not my number stats is saying number it's a number of this year so 41 percent are carrying the load not going to work i'm sorry not it cannot work now money is moving to the western cape forget why it's moving to the west cape it's moving to the western cape and what's happening is that money is in actual fact uh, lubricating basic infrastructure and services and that's why you see no potholes okay now, now potholes are, are really a symptom of, of of serious ills and in actual fact once a road develops potholes you've got to redo that road but the road is supposed to be resurfaced scoured and resurfaced every four to five years we haven't done that in 20 years. It's embarrassing where I live in Ikuruleni, what the roads are like. So we've resurfaced our own road, but now we don't have any more money to carry on. Okay. But we've paid our rates and taxes and like so we need money in the system. That's the first thing. And we've got to start. We've got a master plan that says our is 900 billion in 2018 in this country. That's double the debt of Eskom. Eskom's bankrupt. So one could argue that our cities are bankrupt. The reality is they are bankrupt. Okay. By law, they have to balance their budget. So what happens is we'll cut the water, we'll cut the wastewater spending, etc. Et we balance our books that way. Chickens come home to roost. Now, yeah, yeah, this is a number, it's a straightforward numbers game. So we've got this common problem. It hit Joburg because of the perfect storm. And there's one thing I've got to mention is that system, water delivery systems are designed worldwide to have a minimum of 48 hours storage in them. And the reason for that is quite simple, is that if you have any sort of outage or major maintenance, it's viewed that it can be fixed within 48 hours, which is generally the case, can be fixed the exception only that doesn't, so that you are guaranteed a 97 or 98% uh, water level of, of assurance of supply. Cape Town is working towards 99.9 which is one of the only cities in the world doing it. And um, so we all struggle at different levels. But what we're saying is we'll run out of water in South Africa three years out of 100. Well, it, at the moment, it's 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 going to be the other way the other way around. So we don't have that 48 hours residence time in most of our metros because we've added consumers. And Gauteng has gone from 7, 8 million to 16 and a half million, okay, in a period of a decade and a half to two decades. But we have not increased the reservoirs proportionally. So what's happening now is you've got anywhere between between half a day to a day and a half buffer or security or insurance in your system. So now if you add a hot day and rainwater, it, it's not a rainwater issue, okay? Rainwater provides the bulk and rainwater is a national key point and it's provided, as Haman says, generally speaking, straight from Eskom and they're very big pump stations also. But they also do have breakdowns and they had a breakdown last week at the same time when we had massive load shedding, we don't have residence time, the system runs dry, it's made to be wet, okay? It can 
cannot run dry. So when it runs dry air, it gets in, you start recharging the system, you burst everything. Okay? So now, instead of four leaks um, uh, 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 on a kilometer a week, you're getting 16. The next week's going to be 16 times 16 and the likes. Now you're going to replace those pipes, but there aren't any in the country because there's no steel. Okay. And uh, the, the trains can't deliver. So you got this perfect storm and we ju it just happened to, to take place on a very, we had a few hot days and, and I mean, our gardens were fried. So it was, it was really, really hot day. And so with the load shedding and the low residence or buffer time that we have in our reservoirs, we weren't able to fill the systems up and rainwater has a minor hiccup in normal terms. Everything falls over. Now we start recharging and we start bursting all over. So the 23 billion, I can guarantee you, is increased by a billion or two in the last week, you know, quite easily. So the question is, do we panic? No. And, you know, we need to have a central point of truth in all this. We need to have the three spheres of government saying the same thing. They're not. We need the SOE saying the same thing. We belong to government. They're not. We need, And we need to stop politicizing the crisis. Okay. We have failed. Okay. The prime minister of the UK failed. She has resigned, right? That's the right thing to do. So when you fail, you resign. And if the whole government resigns, you have a new election and we start from scratch. The issue here is that we need very smart, very, it's a very complex situation. We need to get our supply chain sorted out and we've, we've just gotten over a, a port net um, um, strike and the likes. You cannot run an order system if you don't. Everything is moved around the world. We don't produce everything over here. In actual fact, we're net importers in the water sector. So it's, we're quite dependent on our ports to keep our water systems going. Okay, our pump manufacturers are mostly overseas now. They've moved off and the likes. So you know, it's, a really, it, it, it's a lot of little things, but it's failed economic policy, which is you know the, the first thing. So what we have to do is, is we, we mustn't panic. Yes, money is leaving the country because we don't have basic services guaranteed. So until 2027, the message we got from the minister was, please don't invest in our country because we won't have water security in our towns in 2027. I'm sorry, but that, that statement has to be retracted because that's not what we need to tell. We've got a problem. We know, everybody knows. It's not like Christy, we could fix the three to five years. This is going to be five, 10, 15 years from when we start. And this is what we're going to do. We all say the same thing. We sing from the same hymn sheet. And what we start doing is identifying where the major issues are. And I'm going towards the digitization route. Okay. Okay, so that we start smarting up the networks because from a human perspective, it's just too much to do. And what we do is we start then focusing and rifle shotting where we need to replace um, uh, uh, infrastructure. And unfortunately, those who pay are going to be paying much, much more. So if you think electricity is expensive, uh, water has gone up by 1,450%, I think, in the last 10 years. It was a small number on our um, uh, municipal bills. It's now become quite a big number. Not as big as energy. It's going to become as big, if not more than energy because we can't do anything without order. But money has to go into the system. The good news from a South African water chamber perspective is that there is no choice, but government has to collaborate with the private sector. So the rules have to be modified and they have to be modified in such a way that we do not um, attract skull buggery and, and the likes that we've had because we've been very good at that. We have to be very efficient in, in, in our system, but we have to put our minds to it. And I think we've got the kernel of the skills we need, but this is so big. We need to mobilize people for 900 billion rand. Now you saw, we couldn't even weld the boiler tubes for Madhu and Kusili, we have to import people from all over Asia. This and, and that was 400 to 450 billion. This is 900 billion that we've got to spend. It is a big number. And, you know, I think every household needs to have it on their water meter and on their fridge. If you've got a fridge or next to your TV, 900 billion rand, we need crowdfunding, guys. We've got to put our hands in our pockets and we've got to fund 900 billion. Okay. Who got us here? Sort of out the battle box. But that's the reality we have. And my neighbors, okay, they speak to me and they say, what's going on? It's like, this is new. But I said, 20 years ago, we were saying this. It's not new. It's just that it's gone the wrong way. So it's going to cost us a lot of money. The technology is there to sort it out. And in actual fact, um, it equally needs 20 billion. And the whole emergency fund for South Africa is 5 billion and has to be spread quite a bit. And normally it goes into things like very basic, um, not into infrastructure. So, so, so providing people with shelter, with food and water and, and all the likes. So there is no money now. So, so is Durban going to stay shut because its vulnerable system fell over with the floods? So, you know, with too much water and um, no, who's going to go and swim with the turds now in, in December? You know, nobody's going to go and do that. It's really not, you know, not advertising. And Sugar Rock's beach is still close today as, as we speak. 
And that's where the big money goes and you go to Belita and all the likes. Um, what's happening to the ecosystem? You know, we, we other people's money has run out and that's due to poor economic policies. Now we've got to sort it out. We've got to reboot the system and we have to all club in to get ourselves out of it. And it means a lot of sweat equity effort. We have to stay calm and a lot of money. Okay. So those who haven't left and those who are in the country, you have to put a lot of money towards water because it's a slow process. And what we're going to do is we're not good. We've seen in the duplicate we're not good at mega projects. We're going to have to import some very, very skilled project management um, uh, people to be able, not engineers, project management people to be able to use the latest supply chain management and project management office um, um, strategies so that we can start expediting this. Yes, they're expensive, but we can't afford not to do it. And the one issue we do have, and to me it's a problem, it's not a challenge, is that worldwide the water sector is booming because people have woken up a while ago, it started booming about 10 years ago. So people flow towards good opportunities safe, secure environment and, and, and a reasonable income. So we're going to have to compete in that. And believe you me, with a rand at 18.36 to the dollar, it's going to be quite expensive. But we have to do that. You know, so instead of spending money on um, bloated civil service and three times the employees we need in Eskom and three to four times the amount of councils we have in local government, we're going to have to put it in fixing in infrastructure, water and energy at the same time. They're really interlinked, you know, so we can't really separate them and we can't do um, uh, one without the other. They're totally interlinked and our systems are not designed designed to operate under electrical load shedding. A lot of people are asking the question, but why don't, why, why? Our systems are all designed to run 24-7, 365 days. They weren't designed not to run. And because of the issues we have, we're now in a situation where it's intermittent supply and no town planner in the world designs around that. Ukraine today, in the last week, 30% of their power stations were destroyed. They don't have load shedding. And their trains, you know, still running. They've got a full-blown, a full-blown war. So, you know, we've got to contextualize it. So we're, we're at war with ourselves internally here and we're in a, very very bad pickle and uh, we need to get ourselves out of that pickle and at the same time we have to attract tourism and various investments in the night it just gets a bit more difficult and for me that makes me very uncomfortable from my selfish perspective because you know how do you survive if you can't trade with the world because you don't have water to run your factories and and water for for, for employees and staff and the like government needs water also so yeah i think we've got the wake up call and let's take the good side of it and um, let's get in uh, boots and all and get our hands dirty and wet the process that's been used by, by Rainwater, which is the big utility that supplies, you know, much of Gauteng, uh, there are others too, but uh, Rainwater is the largest one here in the Gauteng region. They don't use desalination. There is a classical treatment process which is capable of treating uh, properly the water from the Val Dam on the basis that it does not get polluted. Now, herein lies another challenge because the rate of pollution of the Val Dam is increased and that has to stop because if that water gets more polluted, the current process and the technology being used at rainwater to supply the water it currently supplies will not suffice to remove some of the bad compounds that come through with the pollution and hence it's going to cost you a lot more money to replace the technology and that also takes time and time is something we don't have in South Africa at this point in time so really you need to sort that pollution element out so I don't see a need at this stage for desalination in addition the plans for the additional infrastructure to be able to supply at least another 600 to, to 800 megaliters a day, those plans were well put in place. It's just that that infrastructure has not been built yet uh, for many reasons. Now that infrastructure not in place and we assume that downstream we will also get a permit to abstract that quantity more water from the Val Dam and we also assume that the Lesotho Highland scheme which is delayed will kick in timelessly so we have access to that additional water as a resource to put through the new infrastructure when it's built um, on the one hand but see all that money that's being spent on that additional infrastructure would not have been required if you do the numbers and if you reduce the leakage from 40 percent to 10 percent you would not need to augment that infrastructure with the billions of rands by saving that quantum of water so we are on a lose-lose situation here we, we're trying to spend the additional amount of money to put in the new plant to purify the water in the meanwhile we're not abating the 41 percent the leaking bu bucket syndrome which is still costing us more money. These two things can't be 
happening simultaneously, the cost to South Africa is just too high. It's way too high. So we have to tackle this problem now simultaneously on various fronts. Not only the energy, but on the water side, we need to go to the resource. We need to stop the pollution. Then we need to look at the infrastructure in the utilities, which are the bulk utilities, the wholesalers, so to say. Then we need to look at the municipalities. Now, unfortunately, as Banoi has indicated, these municipalities and the utilities fall under different ministries in the same government. And this doesn't augur well for an integrated approach to solve a problem. Now, you know, the global experience again demonstrates that if you have all, the entire value chain under one government ministry, then you have a clear picture and you have the control and the ability for you to shape up each segment of the value chain so that one plus one then can become equal to three. You get the multiplier effect. At this stage, we're not getting it because I don't know that they're collaborating as well as they should. Uh, and, and, you know, are all the parties talking around the table? I'm aware that there would have been a so-called war room set up. You know, that's an interesting notion that we have to declare war when we have a problem. I mean, we, we have a water supply problem. We have an energy problem. We, you know, we're not in combat mode. The mode that we're in is to seek solutions. I know that there is a type of a war room set up that's been set up, say, at Rainwater, where they would be liaising with all of the customers, which are the municipalities, so that they would be saying to Johannesburg, okay, we can supply you X amount of water and not Y, which is what we have been supplying. Now, how are you going to make good with X to make sure that your and entire population of Johannesburg, you know, there's no segment that dr runs dry. Remember, you have high-lying areas, you have low-lying areas. That is a particular skill that is required in the municipal sector. Those are not skills that are easily available for you to have that acumen to reconfigure your system. The technology has to be up to speed for you to reconfigure, for you to open pumps, close pumps. By and large, we're working on mechanical pumps. We're working on mechanical systems. And so there is also a danger when you keep opening and, and, and closing this valve etc that you could cause damage the, the system in rainwater you know which is about 100 or rough was never ever designed for intermittent supply no municipal network in south africa was designed for intermittent supply the word intermittent has only arisen recently during this crisis it's sad to say that in my knowledge of the water sector in south africa south africa was proud of the notion that it was a 24 7 supplier of world-class quality water. That was my function at Rainwater. Now, we used to talk about intermittent supply in India, where the average supply of water was only three and a half hours a day, which meant that every building in India you would go to when you fly in, you would see they have tanks, what we call Jojo tanks here, right? And those tanks were storing water so that they could use it in the hours when they don't have water supply. That was not the situation in this country whatsoever. Now, it appears that we are going to retrogress, in my view, to the system of Jojo tanks. Everybody talks about Jojo tanks these days. I mean, I, you know, it was, you know, another day, uh, sometime recently, I heard one mayor of a big city talking about solving the problem by putting in Jojo tanks. Well, what happens if you don't have water? How do you fill the Jojo tank? The preoccupation has largely been on water supply, but the opposite side of the coin of water supply is water quality. Now, water quality has a huge impact on public health, right? Just like sanitation has an impact and wastewater has an impact on public health. Now, if your systems are not designed for intermittent supply, you, you know, you stop, go, stop, go. What is actually happening with the water quality? Well, you know, you might have water sitting in a pipeline for longer than the period of time you should. On the other hand, is that a good thing? And so that you need to increase your vigilance around water quality because you want to know that when you supply people with water, not only are you supplying them, but that the quality of the water is such that they don't become sick, they don't get ill, etc. Because that again can put a huge load on the public health system, which has just about come out of the COVID situation, and we know during COVID that we don't have the best health system in place in this country to deal with uh, catastrophes of this nature. So, you know, it, it might sound like <laughs> a sad story, but this is the reality of the ground. You know, the water business is a complex business. You know, you're in the health business. Here. Recently, we know that the blue drop and the green drop reports were released. And, you know, those reports indicated clearly what is the status and the condition of, of water infrastructure on the one hand and wastewater infrastructure. One of the one of the requirements by law is that the people that operate the water treatment plants, the water treatment operators need to have certain qualification and that is embedded into the green drop
process of assessment. Now, one has to say that we're not where we should be. We are really not where we should be with the skills there, if you look at those reports. So in some areas, and as Benoit pointed out, especially in the smaller towns and cities, etc., the skill level is not where it should be. I mean, but we need to move speedily to fix this. I don't know that we've been doing enough, fast enough to get this done, because in some countries in the world, you know, the skill levels are very high. If you go to Singapore, if you go to some of the more developed economies of the world, like Korea, etc., you'll have people with honors and master's degrees that are performing those functions. But again, technologically, they're more advanced there. And then they, you know, they sit in control rooms, they know exactly what's going on, they're giving decision-making powers, etc. Out here, that's not our situation. And sometimes these folks, you know, despite whether they have the skills or not, they need to make decisions like, should they add more chemicals? Should they not add more chemicals? Do they have enough uh, chlorine available in order to disinfect water? Perhaps they run out of chlorine and therefore you don't get disinfection in moments in time, etc. These are realities. These are realities, but they need to be tackled. So at the operator level, yes, we need to ensure we have the right skills and the right people looking after us because it's what is a public health issue on the one hand. On the other hand, we need great planning engineers. We need great project managers. But all of this requires the right culture because, see, you can have the right engineers. You can have an excellent plan of what you want to do. But if those people are not able in a system that is so bureaucratic and so, you know, designed in a way that they're not able to procure uh, the things that they need timelessly, etc., then their hands are tied. As much as they know what they should be doing and they know how to fix it, they, the system doesn't allow them to move ahead and solve the problem when they would like to have problem solved. So there's a whole series of issues here that I think that, that in our country we need to get on top of very quickly in order to move ahead. Of course, lastly, as Benoit indicated, the private sector is there. The private sector is supposed to be there. They're supposed to be skilled as well. And they're supposed to have acumen to come in and help. Now, we need to create the enabling environment for them to come in. Because whilst we agree that National Treasury has all sorts of rules and that we should ensure that we are a corruption-free society, we subscribe to that. We respect that. But this is not business as usual. The country is sitting in a desperate situation. So therefore, we need to expedite those processes in the interest of, of fixing up our infrastructure to bring in the right private sector players, the public sector players, and say, okay, folks, where are the skills? Who has which competency? What can we do? Where's the low uh, hanging fruit? How can we move ahead? And how can we begin to demonstrate and change the narrative in South Africa? I think that we, we've had too many days in this country with bad news. Way too many for many of our lifetimes to come into the future now. We need to change the narrative. We want to be, we want to be waking up with some good news stories to say, hey, did you know that this little town out there is on top of its situation and it's improving and it's conquering its problem? Uh, Johannesburg residents, do you know that we're doing X, Y, and Z in order to ameliorate your crisis? That's the kind of narrative we ought to have in a country that is trying to aspire to improve and slowly aspiring toward excellence, which is what we had. This country was steeped in excellence. ESCOM was a globally well-known utility. So have been some of the other water utilities in this country. Some of the best scientists and engineers in water have come from South Africa. They're sitting all over the world. You know, they're doing all types of great stuff. Some of the best innovations came from here. So here's the time for us to get together to overcome. You know, one example in case in point was the 2010 World Cup. We got it done, right? All said and done, we got it done. So where is that energy and spirit now, 12 years later, when our country has this level of problems? We need that level of energy in order to say, we can do it. Let's sit around the table together and let's innovate the plan and let's move step by step with small victories and let's give people good news to celebrate. Thanks. Those who allowed it to happen cannot fix it. So um, by definition, government is overwhelmed and cannot fix it. Definitely not on its own. So, you know, governments are there to govern. And, you know, the gentleman there, Jacques, talking about, the, you know, it's a governance lapse. Every plant has a license and you have classified operators from north to six or seven, etc., depending on their size and complexity and the like. Why is the regulator allowed these plants to have unqualified people, for example. So the Blue and Green Globe report shows us that you know 97% of the plants do not, um, uh, you know, do, you know, do, do not comply. So yeah, you know, we, 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 the opportunity from a business perspective is is the 900 billion rand in 2018 money. So it's way over a trillion rand now. But I think the number was understated probably by 50% purely because uh, the networks are underground and all the likes. And now if we go and dig in and take stock properly, we're going to find that there's two to three trillion rands worth of water 
own infrastructure that has to be reinstated, not replaced, reinstated. Replacing it is, is much more. Um, but put a multiplier of four onto that. Okay, so we've got 8 to 12 bill, a trillion rands worth of economic GDP value add. So it has to be done, um, uh, you know, in a, in a very, let's say, smart way, appropriate way. And we don't want a Zondo commission after this. But this is this is really, really big money. So the private sector and money will flow where the returns are the best. And there's, um, you know, international money. There's a lot of international money that is earmarked for Africa and the likes. Unfortunately, we have a bad reputation and we need the Zondo Commission um, outcomes to be implemented to try and overcome that because one of the realities we have in the water sector is a lot of the multinationals are very wary about coming back into, into South Africa. And it's one of the things we've been trying, you know, trying to deal with. But I'm sure we can overcome that and get our credit rating up, you know, and the likes. So there's a huge opportunity. But also this week, the um, reindustrialization master plan for water and sanitation was released by TIPS on behalf of DTIC. And here's a chamber worked in with, with a lot of stakeholders there. But, you know, what it shows is that on the back of this master plan, and now let's say we've got a catalyst with the issues and the problems that have surfaced in the last couple of weeks, is that there's an opportunity to reindustrialize so that we can become net exporters of the components that go into the water value chain. At the moment, we are net importers. And in many things, including the water sector, we used to export technology, valves, taps, fire tanks, um, finished systems. Now we import virtually everything, uh, not piping and tanks, but virtually everything. And that's got to reverse itself. So there's an opportunity to reindustrialize. But I'm not going to build my factory here and invest 100 million rand, for example, which is not a lot of money in euros or, or dollars uh, these days. I'm not going to do that if I know that there isn't a reasonable security around my water and energy and labor and logistics. I've got to bring my raw materials through ports and all the likes. So, you know, that's what we call them network industries. They, they, they're on singular. You know, they are connected to everything. So we need water security to get water security back in. We need a basic water security. We need a basic water security. The difference with water is no substitute. Whereas with the energy, there is or there are. Um, so there, there's really huge, huge opportunities. So we're sitting on a, on a cliff where we could fall down or we could go up and we could rebuild ourselves. Um, unfortunately, the country needs to change its governance structure, its its procurement architecture. And, you know, we also need to start believing in ourselves. And, um, you know, we just can't have this discam nonsense, for example, that we've had there. And I don't say that with any apologies. OK, you deserve everything that, that, that you're getting. We need to have that nonsense out because that doesn't do any good for reinstating the, the faith in people here and people from outside towards inside, you know. So we, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of PR work to do, but we've got to get our ports going again. We've got to get our electricity sorted out. And um, and, and the water can be one of the rebuilding pillars, a Marshall Plan. You know, we've been decimated by three decades of internal warfare, economic warfare and sabotage. We have to rebuild it now because we know we have to. And I think there's enough people who want to do that. And, um, you know, the water sector has been damaged for, 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 for three decades. Uh, the, the first decade of my life was really good. And then it started, went into purgatory in the last two decades. We, we, we just pulled out of it, went into other businesses because it just was no investment from government that made it worthwhile. But, you know, the, the, the sector is nearly 200 billion rand a year. It's a big sector. It's a very big sector. It is 10 times the size of the waste sector, for example. Um, so, and the energy sector is, is, is obviously bigger, but it's not a small sector at 170, 180 billion rand a year. And and we import most of what we need to to, to, to maintain our plants. Though, and we do maintain some of them, not all of them, but um, the fiscus can't pay for this. Uh, you know, so we need to inject a lot of capital skills and the tertiary institutions and the likes are all waiting. They say, what courses do we design when we're doing this industrialization master plan? And they said, there's no demand. So we've got the courses ready. We modify them according to the skills that we need, but we need demand. And demand is generated at local government level, not at national. National level puts policies together, local government implements, and local government cannot afford to be where it is now. That's where the economy is 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 churned and, and, and nowhere else. And this is why we see the Western Cape is in actual fact attracting a lot of the big money and the likes, purely because their basic services are a little bit better. They're not perfect, but they're a little bit better. So people are moving down to the garden route and to Cape Town and all the likes, not to retire, they move into businesses. And a lot of people will commute and commute up here and the likes, purely because there's a promise of less load shedding, there is less but eventually none. There's better water services. They had a very good scare with, with the lead up to day, day zero. Um, so, you know, in the end, basic services what attracts, um, you know, um, investment and economic activity. You know, people say that ESCOM's too big to fail. It failed. It's bankrupt. It got injected 40 billion last year to pay its interest bill. It's bankrupt, okay?
that the water sector is bankrupt and we have to recapitalize it. And I think, you know, because the taps are running dry, people are starting to realize that maybe there's truth in it. You know, our cities are really, really stretched. So it's got nothing to do with population growth and all that. Everybody must pay a bit. You know, food is a human right. It's not for free. Water is a human right. It shouldn't be for free. And that's one of the killers that we have. But the leaking bucket syndrome is our biggest problem. And that's really an investment and governance and management issue. And I believe we can overcome that. I believe we, we really can. It comes to getting a hold of water from various resources, the Sutu Highlands and all the likes, and producing good water, as long as it's not too polluted, I think that we're quite good at. But it's no use delivering it to a leaking bucket. That is criminal. If we take away that 40% to take it down to less than 10%, a 5 would be excellent. A 15 is sort of acceptable. 10 would be really, really, really good. What happens is we've got enough water going forward for everybody, and everybody pays the bit on a sliding scale, and the rich do subsidize the poor. That's how it works worldwide, okay? So, but everybody pays. There's very few countries in the world where purified water of a good standard is for free. It isn't for free. And the sewage is to be treated also. So um, unless anybody working in the sector wants to do it for nothing, somebody has to pay for it. And it's just not enough people paying for it. And that free water issue will topple the government, I think, because um, it was put in to keep a government in power. And if it's taken away now, it could topple the government. So you can understand that the water issue is an important issue. It's not trivial. We all have to pay because we get what we pay for. So if you don't pay, we don't get. Um, so we need to lubricate the system. And the system has to be wet, otherwise it collapses. Some very sobering <laughs> thought there. Thanks, Benoit. Can I ask you for a closing comment? And then, Benoit, uh, your closing comment, please. I think that, you know, in closing, I'd like to say that we are not the first country in the world to face this challenge. So, you know, we don't want to end up as doomsday folks. Many countries have experienced these challenges. Many have overcome these challenges. The case studies are clear. The examples in the world are there. What it takes is good governance, good leadership, skilled people, and most importantly, strong political world. Those four ingredients, we can turn this country around. And I'm confident that if we put those four things in place, that there are many of us in this country that can sit around the table and we can innovate a plan to fix this country up and bring it to its former glory in terms of water, sanitation, power, wastewater, etc. Well thumbed up. Benoit, your closing comment, please. This is from my perspective. We must stop scraping the bottom of that leaking bucket. You know, there's no dignity the way we are living at the moment. And the poor of the poor are really those who are being getting hit very very hard we need to stop scraping that barrel we need to fix that leaking bucket and we can do it we must elevate ourselves and you know nobody can say that we don't have problems we've got problems we know what they are let's get stuck into them let's stop the talk shops we talk to each other we collaborate let's have action shops let's get things done and let's only be measured by what we deliver not by what we say we're going to deliver what we deliver and i can tell you now if we do that we can like we win the rugby world cup we can pull ourselves out of this quagmire and everybody wins. It's not just some people, everybody actually wins because we need to drag the, th the, the 30 or 40 million people who are living in abject poverty. We need to drag them up and we can only do that by having water security. So I'm looking forward to us turning this around. I believe we can. I'd hate to be proven wrong because it's really not a pleasant place to be at the moment. As we're talking now, we've got water shedding, load shedding. Luckily, my internet shedding is seems to be over now. We seem to have got that right, but that was a month of struggling just to have internet connections. Uh, that will be for, for, for another story, another day, but complete ineptitude and lack of governance resulted in that. We know what we've got to do. Thanks, Ben Wand. Uh, thank you so much, Haman. This was the Water Hour, and we'll see you on the next episode.